Hi, my name's Eric. I'll be reading you selections from the e-edition of today's Cape Cod Times. Today's date is June 3rd of 2024. It's a Monday, and we'll start with the weather as we always do. Across the Cape and Islands today, partly sunny, very nice day. It may start a little overcast, but it'll definitely clear up this afternoon. High of 74 expected. Tonight, partly cloudy, a low of 53. Tomorrow, Tuesday, mostly sunny, same as today. High of only 66, though, and a low of 56. Wednesday looks pleasant, with times of clouds and sun. High of 72, low of 62. But watch out for the later part of the week and the weekend, because rain is definitely coming in. On Thursday, humid with showers, possibly heavy thunderstorms. High of 70, low of 63. Friday, high of 73, low of 62 with low clouds, perhaps some sun, and then over the weekend, rain expected this coming weekend into next week. So plenty of wet weather ahead, but we have a couple of very nice days ahead of us right now. Sunrise today will happen at 5.08 a.m. Yes, that's 5.08 a.m. It's coming up. And it will set at 8.11 p.m. We will have 15 hours, 3 minutes of daylight. The moonrise will be at 2.57 a.m. and set at 5.14 p.m. Now, heading to the front of the paper, where the news and, uh, of course, the news and the lottery results are kept. And we read these lottery results because somebody asked for them. If there's something you would like read to people who are blind or print disabled, you can email us at info at audiblelocalledger.org or call us at 508-539-2030 and we'll consider reading it. And if you miss any of the information that we share in our readings, you can always go to audiblelocalledger.org. The upper right corner is the archived readings tab. Click that, you'll find a week's worth of our newspapers and periodical readings there for your listening enjoyment. You'll also find our shopping guides there, so you'll know what's on sale at the grocery store. For the latest results of the lottery, we go to MassLottery.com because the Cape Cod Times goes to press too early to be able to give you the latest results, and if you ask for them, you certainly deserve them. So for the numbers game of Sunday, June 2nd, yesterday, in the midday drawing, the numbers were 8 Eight six six. Yesterday's midday drawing numbers in the numbers game, 8866. Eight, six. The evening drawing numbers for the numbers game of Sunday, June 2nd were 3872. Again, last night's evening drawing of the numbers game, 3872. Mass cash for Sunday, June 2nd, 4, 10, 13, 23, and 31. And Lucky for Life rounds out our lottery results for Sunday, June 2nd with 8, 16, 19, 20, 25, with 6, the bonus number. Good luck to all who play and remember us if you win. Moving to the front page of today's Cape Cod Times, Fewer Hands on Deck reads the headline. Cape and Islands Ferry Schedules Change with Staff Shortage by Walker Armstrong. The Woods Hole, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket Steamship Authority announced a modification to its summer ferry schedule in response to what it said were concerns over crewing levels, a move that could potentially affect passengers traveling to the islands with their vehicles. Sean Driscoll, who's communications director for the Steamship Authority, said the changes will result in a single-digit percentage reduction in car spaces available on ferries. Freight shippers who booked in advance will be prioritized, and efforts will be made to rebook passenger vehicles close to their original travel dates. We will work to find them a space, that, a space that's close to their travel dates if possible, and certainly they can travel without their vehicles and still get over there, Driscoll said. But I mean, it is a reality that some of those passenger vehicles may be affected by this. Four round trips between Hyannis and Nantucket on the Steamship Authority's high-speed ferry MV Iono were canceled on Sunday. Specific figures on affected vehicles are still being determined, he said. 
On the Martha's Vineyard route, the MV Woods Hole will run in place of the MV Governor, and the three trips typically operated by the MV San Cady on this route will not operate Monday through Friday. For the Nantucket route, the MV San Cady will run in place of the MV Woods Hole, and the MV Iano will run four trips opposed to the five that were originally scheduled. The changes will be in place from June 17th through September 5th through throughout the summer peak season. There's just not enough crew. Peter Jeffrey, Steamship Authority board member from Falmouth, said the authority doesn't have enough crew to actually run the originally posted schedule. Part of it's attrition with retirements, and we've also had a very tough time recruiting new people, he said. Then it takes a while to bring people up through the pilot and captain ranks. Driscoll said two individuals are currently in the process of getting their captain's license and six who are working on their pilotage certification. Those things take time, Driscoll said. The Coast Guard also has to certify those positions. And there's a lot of other people who want the Coast Guard to do the same thing. And that's a process we just don't have very much control over. It's an industry-wide issue. The issue of staffing shortages has been an industry-wide issue throughout the maritime sector, Driscoll said, not limited to the Steamship Authority alone. Google staffing in Washington State Ferries or staffing in Alaska State Ferries or staffing at any ferry agency, and you'll be seeing the same effects everywhere, Driscoll said. Though efforts have been underway to bolster recruitment to the steamship ranks, Jeffrey said their strategies could use some improvements. That's one thing that I'm looking at and other board members are as well, he said. Obviously, it's not working well enough since we're unable to meet our posted schedules. What does the schedule change accomplish? The purpose of the schedule changes were to prioritize their primary aim of serving as a vital link between the mainland and the islands, Jeffrey said, ensuring essential supplies such as freight, fuel, and food reach the vineyard in Nantucket. I am cautiously optimistic that we'll meet that standard, Jeffrey said. But again, the focus really has been on making sure that we meet those lifeline obligations to the islands. Jeffrey said the tight labor market and the struggle to attract and keep workers presents a significant challenge, necessitating a reevaluation of recruitment and retention strategies, and underscoring the need for better solutions to support the local workforce. He said the issues compounded by the high housing costs, which affect all industries on the Cape and Islands. Part of it is both a reflection of the growth on the islands, be it good or bad, but the capacity hasn't necessarily been met with planned growth, he said. If you consider the Steamship Authority the highway to the islands, we haven't regionally planned well for what capacity is needed or what level is sustainable. Our next headline, Keating Nixes Authorization for Machine Gun Range Funding by Walker Armstrong. With authorized funding for the proposed multi-purpose machine gun range on Joint Base Cape Cod set to expire in October, language was introduced in the Fiscal Year 2025 National Defense Authorization Act to extend the deadline by a year, which would have reauthorized funding through October of 2025. But due to concerns about environmental impacts on the Cape's sole source aquifer under the base, U.S. Representative William Keating, a Democrat from Massachusetts, said he moved on May 23rd to cut the language related to the reauthorization of funds. Originally, I made an amendment that basically said nothing could be authorized to be spent on the machine gun range until the U.S. EPA made their final decision, Keating said. He was referring to the ongoing EPA process to determine if the project would contaminate the aquifer. He said House Republicans blocked the amendment, arguing it was outside the bill's scope and required approval from another committee, which was not granted. Keating said he then decided to remove the reauthorization language entirely, leaving the October deadline intact. An aide from Keating's office said the language passed committee markup, which was said to be the most significant hurdle. Officials from Joint Base Cape Cod declined to comment. Machine gun practice range is needed, Army National Guard says. Joint Base Cape Cod sits on state-owned land about 30 square miles in total and includes five military commands, bases, and stations, including the U.S. Army, the U.S. Air Force, and the U.S. Coast Guard. 
The National Guard, a U.S. Army installation, is at Camp Edwards, which is described by the Guard as the region's largest training area. On June 22nd of 2023, the Army National Guard issued a request for proposals for a multi-purpose machine gun range, estimated at $8.9 million, according to the release notice. The final bids were due July 17th. Two bids received for the proposed machine gun practice range at Camp Edwards were around $6 million over the $8.9 million estimated cost, according to documents that were obtained by the Cape Cod Times. The machine gun range is needed because the Army National Guard soldiers need to comply with updated U.S. Army qualification standards, including no more paper targets, according to Army National Guard spokesperson Don Veach. The machine gun range is also needed, Veach said, because there is no other place in the state that prioritizes Army National Guard training. EPA factors into the proposed machine gun range. If the EPA finds significant environmental risks, federal law would bar funding for the project. Without the EPA's final decision, the project remains in limbo. And if the authorization expires in October without a decision, the project would need to start the authorization process again from scratch. Andrew Gottlieb, executive director for the Association to Preserve Cape Cod, said the Armed Service Committee's decision to strike the reauthorization language was the correct move, citing a proposal to construct a machine gun range at Fort Devens in northern Middlesex County. He said Fort Devens doesn't sit atop a source of fresh water, and it's still within the state. If what we're really serious about here is a need for the Army National Guard to have access to the proper training facilities, then we should really be looking at the Fort Devens facility, Gottlieb said. We shouldn't base this on the desires of the local command to have it at Joint Base Cape Cod because they think it gives the base an advantage and protection from a potential future closing decision. Also on the front page of today's Cape Cod Times, today's date being Monday, June 3rd of 2024, Rhode Island students converting toy car into child's wheelchair by Johnny Williams of the Providence Journal. In Pawtucket, when the final bell of the day strikes at Blackstone Academy on Tuesday afternoons, a handful of students linger in a room downstairs and they put on safety glasses, pick up power drills and get ready to work. They tinker over a white ride-on toy car the kind that looks like a miniature Jeep Wrangler. Over the last month and a half, the students, who are part of Blackstone Academy's robotics class and club, have been retrofitting the car with dual motors, a joystick for steering and driving, caster wheels, and a chair to turn it into a functioning wheelchair for a child with disabilities. The project is part of Go Baby Go, which is a program that provides modified ride-on toy cars to help children with limited mobility. The program started at the University of Delaware when Professor Cole Galloway, now at Baylor, was looking for an affordable way to help children with cognitive or physical disabilities gain mobility. He found ride-on toy cars were much cheaper and lighter than motorized wheelchairs, which can cost thousands of dollars and they aren't available for younger children. There are now dozens of Go Baby Go chapters. On a recent afternoon, Nitesh Krishan, a junior at Blackstone Academy, oversaw his fellow students as they worked on the car. This is a mini computer that communicates between the joystick and the wheels, and these are the motor controls that actually control the two wheels, Krishan said, pointing at the wires and the electrical parts. Benjamin Phelps, a recent graduate of Brown University, and his twin brother Joshua have been mentoring the students throughout the work. Phelps said the Brown Design Workshop at Brown University provided the funding and the materials for the car at a cost of about $350. The brothers are impressed by how quickly their pupils have picked up the necessary engineering skills to program and modify the car. A lot of Go Baby Go cars around the world are built by college students, and here it was high school students who had learned to solder the day before, and now they're following instructions and they're rewiring the circuit, Benjamin Phelps said. The Phelps brothers intimately know the instructions the students are following because the twins wrote them when they were high school students in Eugene, Oregon. They also designed a 3D printed joystick to control the cars. Phelps said the joystick functions as a trainer so kids can practice for insurance-mandated tests to get approved for a motorized wheelchair. 
The Blackstone Academy students, however, have gone above and beyond, Phelps said. They're customizing the car to fit the functional needs of the child who will use it, including using food-safe silicone on the seat's guardrails and installing a bigger seat. A working stereo and headlights add character to the vehicle. The students will present the car to the family soon. While they've enjoyed building the car, this is what they're looking forward to most. It's been a really interesting process, but I think the thing I'm most excited about is just actually seeing someone able to use this thing that we've built, Krishan said. What a great project. Moving inside the paper, outside mirror shower, likely ignited Harwich Port house fire by Zane Razak. A mirror in an outside shower in the back of a Harwich Port ranch-style house is suspected to have sparked a fire Saturday afternoon, according to fire department officials. This happens quite frequently in the spring, the fire department reported in a press release. During the springtime, the angle of the sun is lower, and shower mirrors, which are often concave, will magnify the sun's reflection off the mirror and cause the exterior siding of the house or the shower to burn. The Barnstable County Sheriff's Office Communication Center received a 911 phone call at 1.48 p.m. about a fire at the rear of a house at the corner of Sunset Lane and Victory Drive. A second call confirmed the address as 25 Victory Drive and reported a large propane tank near the fire. Firefighters arrived to see a house with a significant fire condition in the exterior rear of the property that had extended to the attic. The fire was brought under control in about 20 minutes, according to the department. No injuries were reported, and the house was empty at the time of the fire. The damage is estimated at $110,000 to property and contents, according to the department. A similar incident happened in Harwich in July of 2016, when the sun, magnified by a mirror, caused a fire in an outside shower on Catherine Rose Road and burned an exterior wall of the house. Then, the department suggested making sure the concave side of the mirror is not facing out to prevent fires. Cyanobacteria alerts for multiple Orleans ponds is our next headline in the Cape Cod Times of June 3rd. This is reported by Eric Williams. If you're a, if you're a fan of swimming in Cape Cod ponds or your pet has been known to take a dip, it's a good idea to keep up to date with the latest cyanobacteria monitoring information. The Association to Preserve Cape Cod, the APCC, along with volunteers, pond associations, towns, and the state, is monitoring more than 100 freshwater ponds for concentrations of cyanobacteria, which is blue-green algae, and toxins that are produced by the bacteria. These toxins can affect the liver and nerves and cause sickness in people and animals. When levels rise, association staff members alert towns. The towns then may post a prohibition on swimming and other activities in the pond until the algal population drops. What causes them? Well, the blooms usually occur in the late summer, fueled by warm water or high levels of nutrients from fertilizers, runoff, or wastewater seeping through the soil. But Cape Ponds remain warm into the fall and algal blooms have occurred as late as December, according to officials. Here are the Cape Cod ponds under alert or under a watch for cyanobacteria. In Orleans, Boland Pond in Orleans is under a public health advisory after a sample was taken on May 29th. Observed scum was confirmed to be cyanobacteria. The public's advised not to swim in the pond or drink the water of Boland Pond. Keep pets away. If you come into contact with the water, rinse off immediately. Crystal Lake in Orleans is a pond of concern after a sample was taken on May 29th. According to the APCC, the potential concern status means at the time and place of sampling, results indicate either moderate risk for potential exposure to cyanobacterial toxins approaching but below state standards, or a likelihood for increasing cyanobacteria risk over the next days to weeks. Note, if you notice pond water is scummy or discolored and may have a strong odor, the association advises the public to avoid contact with the water. If you see what might be a suspicious cyanobacteria bloom, notify your local health department and send a photo to cyano, that's C-Y-A-N-O, at 
apcc.org, noting the location, date, and time. Hyannis Nantucket ferry trips are canceled Sunday by Zane Razak. Several Woods Hole, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket Steamship Authority ferry trips were canceled Sunday because of a shortage of workers. Four round trips between Hyannis and Nantucket on the Steamship Authority's high-speed ferry MV Iono were canceled Sunday, according to Steamship Authority spokesperson. The pilot scheduled to operate the vessel was not able to work Sunday, and no other qualified personnel were available to fill in. Passengers will be fully refunded for ticket purchases, or they can use them for passage at another time. The cancellations come after the Steamship Authority recently announced a change to its summer schedule. You can see the page one story that I read today, due to what it called concerns over crewing levels. On the Martha's Vineyard route, the MV Woods Hole will run in place of the MV Governor, and the three trips typically operated by the MV San Katie on this route will not operate Monday through Friday. For the Nantucket route, the MV San Katie will run in place of the MV Woods Hole, and the MV Iono will run four trips instead of the five originally scheduled. And these changes will be in place from June 17th through September 5th through the summer peak season. Much of that was reported in our first story today. From the Cape and Islands section, Barnstable jail receipt of Essex inmates allowed after a court ruling by Walker Armstrong. A lawsuit filed May 20th against the Essex County Sheriff's Office by a group of female inmates seeking to prevent their transfer to the Barnstable County Correctional Facility in Bourne was dismissed by an Essex County Superior Court judge. The judge said the suit failed to demonstrate immediate and irreparable harm. The women, represented by the Committee for Public Counsel Services, claimed in a 21-page complaint that was filed in Essex County Superior Court that the Sheriff's Office moved the inmates from the Suffolk County House of Correction in Boston to the Barnstable facility nearly 100 miles away in violation of their constitutional rights to counsel and equal protection under the law. Essex County Sheriff Kevin Coppinger said that the Suffolk County facility is undergoing major renovations and required the female inmates to be relocated by May 1st. Due to those circumstances, Coppinger said he didn't have a choice but to move the women, adding a lack of space within his county's correctional facilities required him to choose between Hamden and Barnstable counties. It's not ideal, he said. Logistically, it's a little bit of a problem for a lot of people, ourselves included, for the families. But we have to put these women somewhere. The Barnstable County Sheriff's Office said in a statement, the Barnstable Jail has the space, the staff, and the ability to provide security, programs, education, medical, and mental health care to these women for as long as necessary. The Barnstable County facility has space for 588 individuals, the sheriff's office said, with a total population after the transfer being 259. Of those, 156 are pre-trial, 100 are sentenced, and 3 are being held pre-arraignment. In their complaint, the Committee for Public Counsel Service said the move imposes substantial and unnecessary hardships on the women, hindering their access to legal representation and community support. The lawsuit also cited the burden legal counsel family and friends may face due to the longer commute to and from the Cape. The potential impact of this forced move on the women is immense, CPCS lawyers stated in the suit. They will be separated from their community, family, and children. In an affidavit filed with the suit, committee staff attorney Don Don Angela Minton said housing Essex County defendants in Barnstable will significantly impact the women's access to resources that could help them advocate for and receive shorter or non-committed sentences. The travel time, along with bridge and cape traffic, will greatly hinder attorneys' ability to visit their clients within three days of arraignment and make regular visits and respond to emergencies, she said in the affidavit. There's also the difficulty of transferring the women to court. Coppinger said they've been coordinating bus and other transportation services to take the women to and from court in Essex County. He said the last of the women slated for transfer were relocated on May 21st, with about six women still in Suffolk due to outstanding circumstances. The other story in the Cape and Islands section of today's Cape Cod Times, 
13-year-old girl struck by car in Hyannis parking lot by Walker Armstrong. A 13-year-old girl was hit by a vehicle Wednesday afternoon in the parking lot of a Hyannis apartment complex off Bierce's Way, according to the Barnstable Police Department. A police report said the girl was conscious and alert, having sustained a possible leg injury when police and the Hyannis Fire Department arrived on scene. The girl was transported to Cape Cod Hospital in Hyannis and was listed as being in serious condition, said Hyannis Fire Chief Peter Burke. And we'll close out our half-hour reading of the Cape Cod Times today, keeping it all local with some local sports. The high school playoff roundup. Nauset Baseball has a walk-off playoff win. Ethan Beer had the walk-off RBI for the number 16 Nauset Baseball team as they beat number 17 Newburyport 3-2 in the Division Three round of 32 in the MIAA State Tournament Saturday. Chase Beach went the distance with 15 strikeouts. He gave up one hit, allowed two runs, and walked three for Nauset, who was 15-6. and six. In other high school playoff action in baseball, Division Four round of 32, it was number 6 Pittsfield, Two, number 27, Upper Cape, one. The Rams, who were 20-3, and three, snapped a 10-game win streak as they came up just short of an upset win over a top-10 team. In boys lacrosse, in Division Three prelims, it was number 35, Lowell Catholic, 18, number 30, Cape Cod Academy, 9. The Seahawks, who were 10-3 and three this season, came to an end in the preliminary round of the playoffs. In girls lacrosse, Division Three, round of 32, it was number 11, Nauset 17, number 22, St. Mary's 3. The Warriors, who were 11-8, and eight, started their playoff run with a win behind nine goals from Julia Kipperman, Sienna Reeves scored three times, and Kate Miltimore, Zoe Labden, Megan Sullivan, Cleo Donovan, and Coral Punch each added a goal for Nauset. In Division Three, round of 32, it was number 13, Dover Sherborne, 18, number 20, St. John Paul II, 4. The Lions, 13 and 8, lost in their first playoff game. In boys tennis, in the Division Three round of 32, it was number 15, North Reading, 4. Number 18, Cape Cod Academy, 1. And in Division Four round of 32, it was number 8, Sturgis West, 4. Number 25, Seekonk, 1. The Navigators, who are 10-1, and one, kicked off their postseason with a win. They'll host number 9 Cohasset, my hometown, in the round of 16 at a later time and date to be determined. There are no obituaries in today's Cape Cod Times. We'll end with a little bit of advice. From Carolyn Hacks, how to relate to others without making it about you. Dear Carolyn, I've realized I can be selfish and try to relate to others by relating their experiences to my own. So how can I do better? Signed, Recentering. Dear Recentering, try just listening. When there's a pause in the conversation that beckons to you to take part, ask a thoughtful question about that person's experience. Maybe it can be informed by your own, but you needn't say that part out loud. It can also be a good exercise to notice the difference between being quiet because you're listening and being quiet because you're composing the next thing you want to say. The latter is something a lot of people do when they're socially uncomfortable for all kinds of reasons. If you're doing that, then work to recognize it and turn your attention back to the speaker, not to what you want to say next. A reader suggests asking yourself, am I listening or am I just waiting to talk? You're allowed to have thoughts, too, and related experiences can be part of good conversation. But the hijacking risk is high, so any mention of a similar experience is best kept to nugget size, followed by turning the attention back to the original speaker and their experience. Be brief and close the loop. And if you hear yourself messing up, it's also okay to stop in the middle and say, Ugh, I totally hijacked your story. I'm sorry. Please go on and listen to them. And with that good advice, we've come to the end of our reading of the Cape Cod Times, dated Monday, June 3rd of 2024. This is your reader, Eric, saying, be well, be safe, look after each other. Remember our veterans. Bye for now.